And appended here, too, is a medical summary by Nurse Christine Chapel. Ah, Nurse Chapel's sweet summary. Dear, lovely Christine. Bridge to all decks. Welcome aboard Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Nance. And I'm Steve Morrison. Scott, I just feel really good about you and our relationship and the podcast. I just really do. I'm so happy to have you as my friend and partner on Enterprise Incidents. I honestly don't know what I would do without you. I feel like I've been I've been sort of influenced by a, a, a drug of sorts that is making me express my true feelings. How about you, Steve Morris? I feel exactly the same way. Well, it's we amazing. are on the same page here with Enterprise Incidents as we are diving into what I would call a Star Trek trilogy long before Star Trek's 2, 3, and 4 appeared in theaters. This is a trilogy because we have the re-reappearance of Harcourt Harry Mudd, Mudd's passion, Mudd's passion on Enterprise Incidents. And like so many of these other animated episodes of Star Trek, Steve, this is another one that I have not seen in many, many years. And like I remember things about it, but not in the kind of detail where I could talk to you about it like we've been talking you know, these last couple of years about Star Trek. But having said that, I found this to be an extremely entertaining and sometimes laugh out loud funny episode of Star Trek. What did you think of Mud's Passion? I think entertaining is the right word. There are, there are a couple of moments where I'm like, I just completely don't believe what they're doing at all. But barring those, the characters are fun. And, you know, I've always liked uh, Harry Mudd. And so it's uh, I think it is a very entertaining episode. It is absolutely an entertaining episode. It was written by Stephen Kandel, who wrote I, Mudd and Mudd's Women. So he finished off his Harry Mudd trilogy by writing Mudd's Passion. And the way this came about was actually quite simple, according to Stephen Kandel, who said, Dorothy Fontana just called me for a script. It was as simple as that. Having said that, Stephen Kandel actually proposed a third live action episode of Star Trek that was never made, obviously was never made, but it was called, are you ready for this? Hmm. Deep Mud. <laughs> That's a good title. That's a good title. So that story, according to Kendall, was about uh, Mud's escape from the world of the androids from iMud after he tricked those robots into revealing the location of a cache of scientific equipment and weaponry left behind by their makers. So Mud found himself with very advanced equipment, which he used to bribe a group of pirates into helping him escape problem was that he couldn't control these new weapons or the pirates themselves. Of course, they tangled with the Enterprise, and it came down to bailing Mud out of his own problems. Sounds familiar. Uh, and getting control of the weaponry that they could not destroy and sending that weaponry into the sun. So that was the story for Deep Mud. But back to Mud's passion, the production number for this episode was 22008, making it in effect, the eighth episode of the animated series to be produced. It aired on November 10th, 1973, making it overall the 89th episode of Star Trek to air on television. So what I love about this episode is that like more tribbles, more troubles. And uh, yesteryear is that we have a third guest star returning to reprise a role that they played in the original series. So I, I love hearing Roger C. Carmel's voice. And I think one of the things I like about this episode is that he sounds more like Mud, like his, his performance like is more in character, I would say a lot more so than when Stanley Adams reprised his role of, uh, of Cyrano Jones. I felt like he wasn't, you know, quite there, but of course, you know, it's, voiceover, it's animation. And this was definitely an episode, Steve, that they did not, the cast members did not record their voiceovers at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty obvious in the uh, outcome of some of the dialogue. And we'll, we'll get into that. Would you like to know what was going on in the world? Absolutely. Before this? 
So it aired on November 10th, 1973. On November 5th, as you know, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. I spent a lot of time, I went to school in Berkeley, spent a lot of time traveling around on the Bay Area Rapid Transit System known as BART. And on November 5th, the tunnel under the San Francisco Bay opened, and for the first time, you could ride a train from Oakland to San Francisco. I ro- I've ridden that train so many times. That is very cool. Yeah. All, on the next day, also in Oakland, this is not at all very cool, uh, school superintendent Marcus Foster was assassinated in Oakland by the Symbionese Liberation Army, which is, of course, who kidnapped patty hurst wow on the same day pioneer 10 started sending images from the planet jupiter on november 7th we've followed this the whole time congress had passed the war powers act nixon had vetoed it and now congress overwhelmingly overturns his veto so we don't have any more problems with presidents sending off troops without congressional permission we don't have to worry about that ever again on november 8th disney released its animated version of robin hood and on November 9th, and my guess is you are a big fan, Billy Joel's Piano Man comes out. Absolutely. To this day, I know Billy Joel is from Hicksville, New York, but when I was growing up, Billy Joel, you know, growing up in the 70s and in the 80s, Billy Joel was at his peak. To this day, even though I left Philadelphia 31 years ago, when I hear Billy Joel, I think of my upbringing. I think of my family. I think of my friends. I think of going to middle school and high school. Uh, I saw Billy Joel for the first time. I think it was 82 or 83 at the Spectrum in Philly uh, when he was uh, uh, there for the album that had Uptown Girl on it. Uh, was that? Uh, Is it Innocent Man? Uh, at Iron Curtain? Maybe. It's, no, I think that's later. Okay. That's I don't one I of think so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm a huge, yeah, Billy Joel was huge for me too. And in fact, with Karen, uh, we listened to Billy Joel albums over and over and over again. Uh, the first one for me was Glass Houses. That was the first one I really started listening to. But by the time we got to Innocent Man and all the, I mean, I listened to those albums so much and still love Billy Joel. Yeah, absolutely. Would you like to get into Mud's passion? Let's dive in. We are approaching the Arcadian star system on a mission to locate an old friend. And I love how Kirk says that dripping with sarcasm. Yep. <laughs> now, the star date for this episode is listed as 4978.5. So that puts the adventures of Mud's passion between the original series episodes, The Paradise Syndrome and And the Children Shall Lead. But there's a caveat, Steve, because also in between those two episodes is Day of the Dub, or at least in production order. Uh, but the star date for Day of the Dub is never actually mentioned. We only hear Captain Kirk say star date Armageddon. But mm. regardless, that is around the time that Mud's passion took place. Do you think Harry Mud is down there, Spock? The probability of his presence on Motherload is 8-1% plus or minus 0.53. Why can't you just say... Mud's probably there. I just did, Doctor. It's funny. So I, I'm i going back and forth on this. On the one hand, hearing McCoy and Spock make this joke is a classic Star Trek joke. Absolutely. It's also the, it's also the same joke. You know what I mean? And it's like, I kind of go, look, you, you, you need to find ways to make jokes with the characters with aren't actually just repeating the same rhythmic joke. You know? At the same time, I agree with you, but at the same time, that's sort of the rut that we've gotten used to seeing Spock and McCoy stuck in. And again, because it had been, you know, many, many years since I saw this episode, when Spock says, I just did, Doctor, I laughed out loud. And it's, you funny. Know, it's funny. And there's so many reasons why the animated series feels like Star Trek. And the Spock McCoy relationship is definitely one of them. And just at the top of the show, to have that exchange, you can imagine this episode already, if it was a live action episode, being right along the lines of like I Mud or Trouble with Tribbles or a piece of the action. And and you just it just set the tone right there. And I and I I get what you're saying, but I, I dig it. Um, there's also, this is, now I'm just going to be totally nitpicky and I apologize. <laughs> I know this is a nitpick. Kirk's next line is, Spark, let's see how close your percentage is. 
this line makes no sense. And the reason it makes no sense is there's no way to, if you know, like if you go there, he said it's 81%. There's no way to judge by going there how clo- whether it was 83% or 82% or 65%. You're either going to find mud or you're not. You can't just, you could go like, yeah, you were right, but you can't judge how close someone's percentage odds are. It's not right. possible. Right. Well, I maybe, know. maybe Kirk was saying, well, is it side of the 81% or it's the 19%? Let's see which one you're, you're in. Yeah. It's just, it's, you know, and it's so funny, like just little things of this is where I'm irritating to have as a screenwriting teacher because I just feel like, <laughs> no, no, that doesn't make sense. You got to have your, they have to make sense, which of course people don't make sense. People say stupid stuff all the time. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> We're down on the planet and there is Harry Mudd talking to a bunch of miners. Um, this is another nitpick. There's this, he's in this really weird Dutch angle, which is where the camera is angled. There's so many times in the animated series where they pick these really interesting camera angles. I think mostly because they're fun, but they're always like, what, why are we in this angle? Like, what is its purpose? Why did you pick that particular shot? You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway, uh, now I will try to lay off nitpicks for at least 10 minutes. I promise. (laughs) I do my best. I'm going to hold you to it. (laughs) And he is up there pitching his love potion. With this magical liquid, no person of the opposite sex can resist you. Well, what's interesting is that we are once again back to Harry Mudd pushing drugs. This Mm -hmm. was the Mudd's Women was the second episode of the original series to actually film when the original series went to series. So that doesn't count the cage or where no man has gone before. When it went to series, the first episode was Corbomite Maneuver. The second episode was Mudd's Women. And- here you have a show in 1966 about this guy pushing drugs, and it got past the censors. Now, by 1973, uh, I'm sure it was a lot easier to do that, but in this case, it's a Saturday morning animated show. And here you have this character pushing a drug, and it's just one of many reasons why Mud's passion in particular was definitely not for kids. But like, just like got. Uh, a smile on my face when I heard Roger C. Carmel's voice in that very hardcore fet and mud, a t- you know, tone that he projects. I also went, oh, okay, it feels like a throwback to the original show because he's pushing a drug again. So two things on the drug thing. One is, is that I wonder if the reason that you're getting away with it is that it's called a love potion, which is like a classic magical tro- trope out of fairy tales, rather than because. It very clearly is a drug. It behaves like a drug in all sorts of ways, but they call it, it's, they treat it like it's a magical love potion. You know, that's one, that's one thought. The second thought is I think if you could combine this love potion with the Venus drug in one pill, that is a party, my friend. I think you are going to have a great (laughs) night. Yes. uh, You know what? As I was saying that I went, interesting like you have one drug that makes you look pretty another drug that attracts you to the opposite sex you're absolutely right i'm gonna party with harry mudd (laughs) there you go so he goes on with his sales pitch uh and one of the things he's showing in his sales pitch is this beautiful young lady please darling come back to the ship with me okay what do you think she wants well this is confusing to me because she's not a lady she's a lizard well right we don't know that yet though (laughs) yeah so, I mean, it very seems very clear that she she wants sex, that that's what this character wants, this lizard character. But I, I find this this thing a bit confusing, I will say. Uh, it, it is a little confusing, but I went thought, wow, in a one two punch of seconds, I went, I said to myself, uh, this episode is not for kids. And then when she goes, come back to the ship with me, I went, man, this episode is definitely not for kids. <laughs> Are you aware that Harry Mudd is tricking you via an illusion? What? And then Spock fires the phaser at this woman, and she becomes a lizard. The so-called girl is a Regillian hypnoid projecting a simple illusion. A couple of questions about this. Yeah. Is this lizard a sentient being? I, I think it is. If, it, if the lizard in the human form was able to say, hey, hey, let's go back to the ship, then even though you're you're turning the lizard the, the human back into the lizard it still has the uh sentience you know the intelligence the uh, self-awareness of it sure does getting hit with a phaser on stun hurt 
Maybe it hurts enough where it weakened the lizard creature that it couldn't keep projecting the illusion. I just think it's weird that Spock just shot somebody, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who we said is a sentient person. He literally just shot them. Unless, like that's- unless if Spock had encountered a Virgilian hypnoid b- a being before and knew exactly what to do to get it back into its natural state. He's sure. Gonna- Sure. I'd still just go. He just random went. We beamed down on a planet where we have no jurisdiction and shot somebody. (laughs) (laughs) Seems kind of weird. Um, um, It's also weird to me, by the way, is that what we later find out is that Harry has gotten this lizard creature to project an illusion because he believes that the drugs that he's selling are fake and don't work. But they're not fake. They do work. Right. So this whole thing is sort of a bit odd. But once the uh, the crowd sees that this was an illusion, they all start getting angry. I surrender myself, free will, the mercy of the law. And then Spock <laughs> opens fire again and manages to create this huge like stone barrier <laughs> to protect them before they beam up. You know, it's interesting. Like wherever Harry goes, he just causes trouble. You know, he pissed off the miners. Again, we're dealing with miners and Mud's women. And now you're dealing with miners and Mud's passion. So whether or not it was deliberate, you know, maybe there was something to Stephen Kandel's idea to kind of bring Harry full circle. But, you know, we talked about this when we were doing I Mud, that for a little while there, when they were, you know, ta- developing the story for Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, Harry Mudd was going to be in that movie, but then he had passed away before it went into uh, production. I just think it's funny that we come down on this planet where we have no jurisdiction. Spock shoots this person on the stage and then does huge amounts of property damage to this planet. And then they just say, see ya, and they leave. Maybe that's why he did that, because the Federation doesn't have any just jurisdiction there. And if they did, you know, he probably would have been abiding by the laws of the Federation. But because, you know, anything goes. Yeah. Went. I thought we left you on the robot planet, Harry, permanently. Never underestimate the spirit of Harcourt Fenton Mud. So here's the thing. So first of all, Harry is back on the Enterprise for the first time since Mud's women, because in I, Mud, he never set foot on the Enterprise. He was down on the planet. So remember when we are first introduced to Mud in I, Mud, at the end of Act 1, right? Yeah. And then, oh, but then in the beginning of Act 2, Mud starts to fill Kirk in on how yep. he got off the planet of the miners. So now we have Mud telling Kirk how he got off the planet of the androids. And again, this feels like like every time we would see Harry Mud, if this was like an ongoing thing, he would fill Kirk in on how he got out of that last, you know, problem. Right. And it's a, it's a, you know, again, this this feels I not so much like Star Trek, but it definitely feels like an I Mud continuation. Well, this is the so, and this is why I brought up the nitpicky thing at the beginning of Kirk and, and uh, of McCoy and Spock doing a very similar joke we've heard them done before. This one, where he says, I um, borrowed a vehicle, stole a spaceship. <laughs> that is exactly the same rhythm we had in I Mud, which extends even longer. And this one I really like. And maybe it's because. It's like, this is, okay, we're referencing the same joke and kind of doing it again in a new way. And I'm trying to figure out, like, is there a reason that this one I'm totally happy about and the one with Spock and McCoy is starting to sort of wear thin on me? Okay. And I don't have an answer. It might be because, you know, Spock and McCoy are main characters and we've done those jokes an awful lot. Where this is only our third time seeing Harry and only our second time doing the joke. But like... It is fun to bring back a, a, an old bit when the old bit is really well done. So I don't know. I'm I'm wrestling with this as, maybe, as I'm thinking about it. Morris, maybe it's because when this bit was done in I, Mud, it was between Harry and Kirk. That's true. Now it's done between Harry and Spock. So the delivery is going to be very different because it's from coming from someone who uh, you know, professes to be totally logical. And he's kind of having fun with Harry here. Well, it's also because this is why we have Harry Mudd. You know what I mean? Like, that's what his purpose is. Whereas whereas Spock and McCoy, they've been living together for years. Like, <laughs> yeah. could you please stop saying the same thing? You know? <laughs> um, 
Anyway, we hear how he got away. We hear some of the scams that he'd run. And then we talk about finding this love potion and we hear... Which you sold to a thousand inhabitants who immediately became ill from using it. I hadn't counted on their unusual biochemistry. So he has tried the stuff out, but hasn't seen whether or not it actually works and doesn't think that it does. I shall require a medical report on the prisoner, Miss Chapel. Of course, Mr. Spock. Also, I won't say she flirts with Spock, but she compliments him. I think you deserve congratulations for trapping him so cleverly. You exaggerate, nurse. Kindly see that your medical summary is more precise. All right. So my question for you from the top here, Steve, is what is your take of the character of Chapel in this episode? So I think on some levels, I really like her. And I like that they gave Major Barrett a bunch of stuff to do. I find it completely unbelievable that she takes this drug from Harry. Totally don't believe it. It weakens her character. It's and it's totally wrong. I agree on both points. I loved, you know, to see Chapel in such a forefront of a of a story, even if it's an animated episode. But at the same time, I just felt it was totally out of character for someone so loyal to basically betray Captain Kirk and and her duty for her love for Spock, for the prospect of maybe this will be her shot. Now, we have seen, obviously, other crew members betray the Enterprise. I'm thinking of Marla MacGyver's and Space Seed, but she was not a main character, whereas Chapo is. Now, at the same time, Chapo's love for Spock goes back almost to the very beginning in the naked time. And that love, that affection she has for Spock has been one of the few sort of running character traits that we have seen in the original series. The way that she delivered soup to Spock in a mock time, the way that uh, she showed affection for him in uh, a private little war. And of course, the profession of love that she says to him in The Naked Time. And The Naked Time is an episode I thought a lot about while watching Mud's Passion, especially in the, oh, yeah. the third act. Yeah. Totally. So I, I think it's, I, I agree with everything you said, and I want to add to it. I think it's even worse than, I think there's more things terrible about it. It's not just a betrayal of the Enterprise. This is a betrayal of Spock. It is a terrible violation to dose someone with some drugs without their knowledge. And from what Harry's saying, it's permanent. So you're making a permanent change in somebody's character to get what you want out of them. I mean, it's a really terrible thing to do, A. Yeah. She's a scientist. So the idea that she's just going to take an untried you know, drug that she knows nothing about, the only thing she does know about it is it comes from Harry Mudd, who is a, a scammer. Yeah. Who's a liar. Right. You know, like, so, so there's, <laughs> it is stupid. It is evil. It is, there's absolutely no reason that I would ever believe that Nurse Chapel would do this. And if she doesn't do it, then we don't have an episode. So that's why they, you know. Well, regardless, it is a serious lapse in judgment on her part. Uh, but having said that, uh, I agree with everything you said. And, and it does make for uh, uh, an episode that I found to be much better than I remembered yeah. it being. One thing that's also happening is Harry is trying to convince her to take this drug is that on the bridge, we hear that we are, you know, charting an uncharted star system. Binary sun with a class M planet. That's rare enough to warrant investigation. Do you know what I was thinking about when I heard this? You tell me, Steve Morris. I was thinking about another planet that's orbiting a binary sun, and that is Tatooine. Well... And it was a desert planet, right? Exactly. Oh, I think they have arrived at Tatooine. They probably arrived at the other side from Moss Eisley. And, yeah. you know. And they're big, weird monsters living on this desert planet. I, I'm, I'm sold that this is Tatooine. See, I love that that's what you thought, because that's not what I thought you were going to say. Oh, what did you think I was going to say? I thought you were going to say, oh, uh, a class M planet circling a binary sun that warrants exploration, you were going to say, I bet Scott is excited to see the Enterprise doing its actual mission of exploring a strange new world, in which case you would have been <laughs> absolutely correct. 
Um, that is that I, I I hadn't had that thought. Although of course you are excited about that. I also think that recently with the 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 Webb Telescope, they they actually discovered a planet because uh, they're searching for exoplanets that is orbiting a binary star system. Wow! I think. I didn't check up on this, but I feel like I heard this like a month ago. Boy, this this Webb telescope, uh, not to digress, is really, I mean, it's only been operational for what, like a year? It's and a, it's yeah. extraordinary. The images, the discoveries just already. I mean, just imagine when this thing really gets uh, gets going and hit, hitting its stride. We're really going to see and hear about some really incredible stuff. It's been, it's been awesome. Go to space.com and you'll see all the reports that are coming in from the Webb telescope. And as we're ending act one, Chapel has begun to consider it. And now she says, not that I believe you, but well, I suppose I could analyze it. She hasn't agreed to take it yet. We come back in act, act two. Laboratory tests would destroy it, my dear. Why not test it the way it's meant to be used? And this is where both you and I totally disagree with this, but he does convince her. She breaks the thing open. It affects her. She kind of falls into Mud's arms. Yep. And as she does this, she tries to get him back in the brig, but Harry has stolen her phaser and he's stolen like a key card. Um, and I had to look up when did key cards get invented? They started being used in 1975. So this actually predates that. The idea of having a card to unlock something. Look at you, scoop, uh, scoop, Morris, uh, finding up. Uh, this is this is great. I love that. But again, Star Trek a little uh, ahead of its time, not by not by too much there. But that's very cool. I just didn't realize that they had IDs on the on the Enterprise. <laughs> I thought that was super interesting, and I also go like, again, this is where it doesn't all track perfectly and make sense. Harry steals this love potion, but. And he gives it to one group of people and it makes them sick. We don't know that anybody showed any signs of falling in love. Right. He believes that it totally doesn't work. If it totally doesn't work, why use the actual love potion? He'd be using anything if he thinks it's just fake. He has a fake lizard to pose to pretend that it works. Then he tries to convince them that it works. Then he uses it on Nurse Chapel because he knows that it's going to make her woozy so he can steal her phaser and her ID. Right. So he must know that it works to some degree. And I that's why I just keep going like, this isn't all fitting together. Actually, the fact, the way you laid it all out is exactly why it is fitting together because okay. the potion does something. It does he something. Just he just doesn't know if it's going to do what he says. And he's like, it, it, the, the bill of goods he's trying to sell, it, he doesn't know if he's selling that, that, that right bill. But everything, the way you just laid it out was perfect. And, and actually, it's, the story makes perfect sense because of the way you just described it. So thank you for that. I don't think that it does exactly, but I'm glad that, <laughs> I'm glad that I clarified it for you. Um, Chapel goes to Spock to deliver her medical summary and basically kind of stumbles into his lap. All right. I love this moment. <laughs> she falls yeah. on his lap. I mean, this is an animated show. I mean, I'm trying to imagine what this would have been like if like, if it had happened in a live action show, but for, for, for her to fall on his lap and, you know, I just sort of like, I froze the image on my TV, and you know, to see Chapel sitting on Spock's lap is pretty funny. It's cute. Oh, sorry, sir. Are you injured, Miss Chapel? No, no, I, I'm, I'm fine. Are you, uh, uh, feeling all right? And she's really fishing for the effects of the, of the drug. Wouldn't you like me to, um, well, well, stay? That would be illogical, Miss Chapel. And I think Majel Barrett is great as she realizes that this thing isn't working and in a very hard voice says, Yes, it'd be stupid. Because she's pissed at herself for falling for Harry's BS. You know what this reminded me of too? Remember in A Private Little War when Spock is coming out of the, you know, after he was, you know, shot by the flintlock and he, you know, he's recovering mm -hmm. on the Enterprise and he, he comes out of the... I guess that the trance that he's in, when the Dr. Mbenga keeps slapping him, Spock uh, says, oh, I'm quite all right. And then Chapel says, yes, I believe you are. It's that same sort of delivery where she's just irritated yep. because no matter what she would do in the original show, he just would not pay attention to her. I don't think I said this before. I, we certainly talked about Majel and her performance as Chapel, and I think both of you and you and I thought that her performance is number one in the pilot in the cage, 
was better than Chapel. And of course, you're, I know, in the midst of Next Generation and getting to see her as Loxana. Yeah. I think the stiff kind of Chapel character is not the best casting for her. I, agree. I think she, she does better when she has more to do, you know? I could not agree more. The One of the ultimate what ifs, obviously, and we talked about this way back in the beginning of doing this podcast, is what if NBC loved the cage and Jeffrey Hunter was playing Pike through three seasons of the original series? What a different show that would have been. But what a different show it would have been if you had a female number one in the 60s. Yeah. That would have been a hell of a thing. I agree. I thought Majel's performance, just like you, in the cage was fantastic. As Chapel, not so much. And like you point out, I have been doing my rewatch of The Next Generation, and I just started uh, uh, season four. So uh, ending season three, the last couple of episodes, one of them was Menage Troy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Majel as Roxana Troy is delightful. She is so good in that role. I remember when I first saw Roxana Troy in the first season of Next Gen, I like thought she was a little irritating, but she grew on me. And now that getting into the end of uh, season three of Next Gen, I was like, I was, I was happy to see her again. And she's great chemistry with, uh, obviously Patrick Stewart, but, uh, also, uh, Troy, you know, uh, Marina Sirtis, they, they, they were so good together as mother and daughter. Uh, but I agree completely. I think Chapa was not her, her best performance. Well, and it's because of what they give her to do. It's like, Oh, you're, you're stiff, you're lovelorn, you're, you're, you know, there's so much where she's just, yes, doctor. You know, there's just a lot of that. That's not that interesting. By the way, I think she is having a ball being Loxana. There's so many. Luxana is such an irritating character for me. I mean, she's just a real, which is her job. That is, she, that is correct. She's supposed to be irritating, but man, she is irritating. Yeah, sure. And and and, and my uh, my grandmother, my mom's mom, kind of a Luxana kind of person. So I think oh, I have some, some flashbacks <laughs> to growing up with that. Anyway, she's now pissed off. She goes back to the brig to find Harry. Realizes he's gone. Realizing her phaser's gone. Uh, and we see Harry use that card to enter the shuttle bay. And we are back with Spock, who says... And appended here, too, is a medical summary by Nurse Christine Chapel. Ah, Nurse Chapel's sweet summary. Dear, lovely Christine. Oh, delayed reaction, but the effect yep. of the love, love potion is taking effect on yep. Spock. And... When we saw Spock under the influence of, quote unquote, a drug, whether it was, I mean, obviously the effect it had on the naked time was, you know, it made him kind of depressed. Uh, But the effect of the spores in This Side of Paradise, which is one of his very best performances, uh, Leonard Nimoy's, um, you know, with, with regards to the animated series, we're at the point now where for the most part, they were recording their dialogue separately. And because of that, I feel like Leonard's performance when Spock is under the influence of the love potion could have been better. I mean, it's it's okay. I mean, it services the episode as it is, but could have, you know, gone further with it, you know, but there's only so much they can do when they're not acting off of other people. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I also blame the writing. I mean, it's just because all they do is have him say lovey things. Yeah, you know, yeah. like they don't have him and he's not with Chapel and he's not. I mean, I, you know, it's fine, but it's to me, a lot of it just goes back to the writing. We have this really quick cut, which I think is pretty cool to Mud getting a chop on the back from Nurse Chapel, who knocks, knocks him down and gets the phaser. And it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> on the bridge, Spock says, Captain, um, Doctor, I wish to report a um a number of very strange um emotions what um by the way they don't pay nearly enough attention to the fact that spock's acting so weird and we're back with mud you're implying the potion was not completely successful oh no it was i made a complete fool of myself 
See, I think I think Majel's great in this because she's got something really to play. Yeah, which is absolutely. Embarrassment and anger. You're the same fraud you've always been, Harry. I don't know how I could have believed you. And of course, Scott, you and I agree. We don't know how she, we could have believed <laughs> we you. We agree completely, yeah. <laughs> She argues. He tries to get away. She fires, misses, and crystals that were in his hand fell to the ground and get sucked up into the vent. You know where that's going. I do. Yep. And he then grabs her wrist and says, I'm sorry, Christine, but I shall require a temporary hostage. And up on the bridge, we realize Mud is taking a shuttle and that he has Christine. She's in danger, my love. Now, what's missing here is the live action reaction shot from yeah. Kirk and McCoy, which would have been speechless, utter shock, especially from McCoy. And they have reaction shots, but they're the same animated shot. Yeah, we, we've, yeah, seen we've seen them before. Yeah. Before. Yeah. So that's a that's a shortcoming. But we get the idea. We get the we get the picture. But the other thing that's missing is that they don't immediately go the love potion. Like right. They should have, like, this is, the behavior is really clear. They should have figured this out. We're on the shuttle. By the way, I think the interior of the animated shuttles looks really cool. Oh, yeah, it does. Because, you know, we're used to just seeing, like, the one shuttlecraft, the Galileo, that we yeah. saw back in the Galileo 7. That was the only, those shots of the Galileo shot for the Galileo 7 were the only shots of a shuttlecraft used in three seasons of Star Trek. So to see different designs of different shuttlecraft in the Enterprise hangar bay, this is one of the areas where the animation actually does help the show because you can have fun with different designs, different starship designs, which we will see in episodes to come. Well, in the interior of the shuttle that we'd seen on the original series is really simple. It's very kind of blank walls. In the interior of this shuttle, it's really cool. There's all sorts of stuff going on. And there's a big window to outside instead yeah. of like this little – little slit at the top that slides yeah. down, you know, like you see in like metamorphosis. I can't stand the thought of any danger to her, to the woman I love. <laughs> they go, love? <laughs> Spock? And Kirk just goes, well, then I'll transport down with you. But it still doesn't go the love potion, remember? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Lieutenant Imres, her nose twitches and we see gas coming in through the vent. And it immediately, I think, starts to affect uh, Mr. Scott, who sighs, and the camera kind of pans around the bridge, implying, "Uh oh, they're all going to get infected." So, so they kept showing shots of Mares, and then it occurred to me, why isn't Uhura in this episode? No, oh, it's a good question. Yeah, well, did did Uhura lose her job as the communications officer? Because for the last many episodes, it's been Mares in all of them. Well, there were a couple where she was. She was the relief, like when in Once Upon a Planet, Uhura was down on the planet being held mm. by the computer running the Shirley planet, right. and Mares was the communications officer on the Enterprise. So maybe she was a soft duty, and then yeah, Mares I guess was, so. uh, you know, it was her shift. But uh, that is the end of Act 2. We're back in Act 3, and, and we're in the transporter room, and Spock is just raring to go. McCoy enters. He's got the crystals, and he says, A number of these were broken. I guess the ship's air system grill. Lucky for us, they don't work. And I'm like, have you seen Spock? <laughs> like, <laughs> you really know? You know, we talked about Kirk being the observer and being so smart and picking up on everything. It's like, dude. Pay attention, man. Yeah, he's a little thick in this one. Yeah. <laughs> Not getting it. <laughs> and then there's a really weird just pause in this because they haven't beamed down yet. We hear from him rest that the shuttle has landed. Uh, and Scotty says, And the captain's in transports about it with our ever-loving Mr. Spock. <laughs> and Imrest looks at him and says, <laughs> You're funny and very attractive for a human. So, okay, so first of all, again... You have Mares hitting on Scotty. Yeah. So now, in addition to having an episode with drugs, in an episode where a woman is propositioning uh, uh, Mud go back to the ship so they can do something, alluding to you know what, now you have Mares, this cat-like feline alien life form hitting on Scotty, and you have interspecies love. Yeah. Again, yeah. definitely. Not for kids. Yeah. The other thing I picked up on watching this episode is at one point, Mares says, coordinates relate to transporter room four. Mm. 
So I'm thinking to myself, was there a prior episode of the animated series or even the original series that referred to more than one transporter room on the Enterprise? I think so. I feel like we've heard that, but I couldn't tell you which episode it was. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure Enterprise was listening will be uh, quick to correct me on this. Yeah. I, I know this is not the first episode, but I really took notice to this because, wait, transporter room four. So let's say there is at least four transporter rooms on the Enterprise. Why didn't we use one of those to get Captain Kirk off the constellation in the Doomsday Machine? Or oh. Right? Or why didn't we use one of the other transporter rooms to beam uh, Sulu and the landing party up <laughs> to keep them from freezing to death in the enemy within? You know, I start thinking of like, well, what about this? And what about that? Well, it's, it's so funny. I remember watching, I used to watch the original Superman TV show with uh, George Reeve. George, George Reeve. And, uh, and there was some episode where he walked through a wall that he became immaterial and walked through a wall. And yeah. it just, I, and I remember because I was probably 10 or 11 at the time. And go. That's the first time it clicked in my brain. It's like, oh, they're never going to use this again. They're just using this for this. This would be useful in all sorts of time, but no. And it's it's true of so much science fiction and superhero stories where it's just like, yeah, that would be useful if we thought. I mean, honestly, if I had the uh, serum that we used on Plato's stepchildren in my pocket, I'd use that all the time. <laughs> well, but at the same time, Steve, what did we learn? Way back in where no man has gone before. I was going to say that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's exactly what I'm going to say. Screw that. I'm still <laughs> going to use it all the time. All I'll right. be good. For, for, I'll your, be good. For, for the sake of this conversation, you're right. I would totally be like taking advantage of that serum left and right. I mean, not even to do that, but like, okay, you're in you know, name whatever episode you want. Like you're, you're trapped by you're in, it's in day of the dove and, you know, just like, give me a little bit of that shot. We'll take out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, we're down on the, on the planet Tatooine, and <laughs> we're talking about that. Harry's going to find basically some people that he's going to scam. Um, and as they're talking about this and we hear Chapel say, we haven't seen any evidence of intelligent life or any life. We see a big, so obviously a rock creature and they keep cutting to it. They're not being subtle at all. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and he's saying, well, then we can relax. There's no danger. And I'm like, come on. I see the big giant rock creature. I know it's going to open up its eye at some point. <laughs> um, and finally, that's exactly what happens. It opens its eyes. And then we're back in the transporter room where for some reason Spock and Kirk have are just beaming out now. It's, I thought it's they like, already beamed down already. <laughs> no, it's to that's what I mean. There's this totally bizarre time thing where we just like leave them there for a long time. But finally we do beam down. And as they beam down, we see more gas coming out of the vents. We're on the bridge. Scotty is humming a Scottish ditty, and Eric's is playing on his giant loop, and Mrest seems to be feeling good. I think these are some good drugs. That's These what are I, good drugs. And this is where I started to think really about the naked time. Yeah. You know, before things got serious, because obviously in Mud's Passion, you don't have the Enterprise spiraling out of control towards Psi 2000. But what you just have is the Enterprise crew feeling pretty groovy, like yeah. they did at the end of uh, Wolf in the Fold. Yeah, totally. And, but it, it, it again, this is another kind of throwback that makes me feel like early original series where the crew is having a good time and and uh, things kind of get a little crazy. I mean, we never get to see that evolve and get nuts and to the point where maybe the Enterprise would be in danger because everyone's feeling a little too cool. But still, it was it was pretty fun and and you know, like anytime I sort of think back and connect the dots between an episode of the original show to to an animated show outside of the fact that it's a direct sequel to another anim original series episode you know it makes me feel good in my feeling about the animated series being the fourth season we never got totally i, I do like the line by the way anybody keeping a trace on the captain and mr spock <laughs> we're down on the planet spock's boot like sinks into the soil and kirk grabs him and Spock says, Thanks, Jim. It's good to have a friend like you. Strange, that's the way I feel about you, too. And then we cut to a shot 
where their arms are around each other. And Kirk says, my dear friend Spock. All right. I have a lot to say about this scene. Okay. All right. So first of all, I love this scene. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to imagine how this would have played out if it was a live action episode. But this is the first time. Is this the first time where Spock and Kirk have referred to each other as my friend? Because we have heard Kirk say, refer to Spock as his friend, like to McCoy in a mock time. And uh, to the Commodore who's on the Enterprise in Galileo 70s, says, I, you know, I can't leave those people stranded out there. They're my friends. But has in the original show, I mean, obviously in Star Trek II, you have Spock say to Kirk, you're my first officer. You are also my friend. I have been and always shall be yours. But here you are saying, have this, this the culmination of, of this five-year mission, you know, between these guys. Spock, even though he's... It, under the, the effect of a love potion, he's saying, hey, you know, I'm lucky to have a friend like you. And Kirk says, I feel the same way. And I went back to something you pointed out many times throughout our voyages on the uh, 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 original series through Enterprise Incidents, that line back in the naked time where Spock says, when I feel friendship for you, I'm ashamed. Now you have Spock saying, it's good to have a friend like you. I think that's, I like that. Uh, so first of all, I do too. Uh, I, I have many things to say about this as well. So I think they definitely have said it about each other because both, I believe when he's talking to T'Pau, he says, they're my friends. Right. He also says, after he thinks Kirk is dead, I, I've i killed my captain and my friend. So he right. definitely said that. There's also the moment in Whom God's Destroyed where he ta- where Kirk says, he's become my brother. You know, oh, which isn't exactly great. the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I feel like they say, I also think it's important, again, to say that we're now no longer in the mid 60s. We're in the early 70s. So things have evolved a little bit. But dudes didn't do this in this way unless they were drunk or and I just had to say, like, this is very specifically the experience of of an actual drug that I have done and i've had these moments where you suddenly have your arm around someone talking about your friendship and (laughs) what's funny about it is going like i don't think mud is exactly right i mean he obviously didn't know what this drug does at all but clearly it's not just you put it on you and the first person you touch falls in love with you this drug clearly has a lot of other effects also that bring down some barriers that i think are it's fun to watch well, I, um, think it, I think Mud said it near the beginning of the episode that one touch evokes friendship between men or women, but between woman and man, love. Mm, you're right. I had forgotten about that line. Yeah, yeah. So he actually does say that. By the way, I want to take that image of Kirk and Spock with their arms around each other. That's totally going to be the thumbnail for this episode. Absolutely. <laughs> so the rock creature has has woken up. It's huge. It has three eyes. It looks pretty cool. It crushes the shuttle. Kirk and Spock run up. We're all shooting with phasers. That doesn't seem to work. It's just getting angrier. Then another one wakes up and Spock runs up to Christine and says, Darling, are you all right? The darling? How do you think Chapel feels to, fu- to like, because right, because all this time she, like when Spock started to fall under the spell of the love potion on the enterprise chapel wasn't wasn't around right so now this is her first time really seeing the effects of it and she's hearing things she has been wanting to hear for almost five years i think in the way that this episode is structured i think it's awesome that's 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 what i think she's feeling i don't think that's what she should be feeling and if this were an hour-long episode of the original series i think it would be uh I I think, you know, when um, Dr. Helen Noel is dealing with Kirk, who's been programmed to fall in love with her through the Tantalus device, what she's actually doing now, she didn't make that happen. But what she's doing is going, we're in a desperate situation. You have to snap out of it. That's actually and uh, frankly, Chapel should feel terrible about doing this to somebody, in my opinion. If we had an hour long, we could explore the journey of, oh, isn't this awesome? The man I love. Uh, is totally in love with me. This is great. And then into, oh, he's not the man I love anymore. Like, 
I have fundamentally changed who he is. Right. This is really, really bad. A, which a, is, a what what I love about him, uh, I don't love about him anymore because it's not the same person. And B, this is not his own free will. Uh, yeah, I, it's a I violation. Happen. Yeah, it's a violation. Absolutely, he corrupt. He violated him. But but you know the. But we don't have time for that. Obviously, well, we don't have time yeah. for that. Sure, but but the rock creatures. I thought, wait a minute, rock creatures. So this is the animated series, an episode from 1973, and rock creatures made their appearance. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the visually the live action aspect of it was one of the problems with this movie in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. Yeah. So something about rock creatures, I guess. But I guess they have rock creatures on Tatooine now, don't they? <laughs> they do. Um, there's also a rock creature in the Savage Curtain. But anyway, uh, they call up to, for an emergency beam out. Unfortunately, the people in the transporter room are dancing. So that's not work out. <laughs> that made me laugh out loud, by the way. Unfortunately, the giant rock creatures are coming in. Kirk can't reach the Enterprise, and then he turns to Spock. Spock, can't you take your hands off her? Is Kirk jealous? Well, that, that's what I thought. It feels to me like he is. That's what I, I, I'm feeling. Um, because because Kirk is high now, too. I think we should get a few things straight. Jim, no, Captain. We're both reacting to the drug, the love potion. I like that Spock came to a little bit. Like Spock came to the conclusion, like he he realized, wait a minute, we're under the influence of this love potion. Like that Spock, like he was the one to say, wait a minute, hang on a second here. Okay, this is what's happening. And of course, the person most excited to find out that it works is Harry Mudd, who says, It worked. And I was selling those crystals to lump-headed miners for a miserable 300 credits. This is, again, where I go, I don't think this tracks. But then we cut to, in the most bizarre kind of cutaway, McCoy just bragging <laughs> to this woman he's snuggling with, talking about he saved everybody on the ship. Which, by the way, he totally saved everybody on the ship yes, multiple times. he did. Times. <laughs> Many times. If the Enterprise, I, I love it, he says, if the Enterprise had a heart, I'd save her too. Oh, let's talk about your heart, my dear. You know what would have been really good if DeForest Kelly delivered these lines with that southern accent he gave McCoy. Oh, yeah, I should have. Yeah, but you know, they weren't thinking, they weren't, again, it was was probably by himself. No one, no one said, hey, remember the side of paradise? That would have been awesome. Maybe we can distract them. That is an outstandingly stupid idea. That was like the third or fourth time I've laughed out loud while watching Mud's Passion. For that reason alone, <laughs> I kind of love this episode. Well, and it, it's so funny because we sort of talked about this with Spock. I am sure he's had the thought that is an outstandingly stupid idea many, many times <laughs> over Kirk's ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And never said those exact words. Harry, do you have any of the crystals left? Uh, two. So they're going to use the crystals on the giant rock creatures? These Which little seems, teeny tiny little crystals little, <laughs> seems real, and and they're made out of rock. <laughs> like, yeah. why would you think this is going to work? <laughs> and then we cut up to the Enterprise, where everyone's now passed out or laying around or looking very much worse for wear. And Sp- Scotty says, oh, "I've got a hangover to shame all previous hangovers, and I did not touch a drop of scotch." Okay, so like I pointed out many times already. During our deep dive of Mud's Passion, this is not an episode for kids. So now you have Scotty talking about a hangover from drinking too much scotch. Again, that is not the kind of message you want to give across to kids watching a Saturday morning cartoon show, even if it's Star Trek. So we've said this many times. Star Trek was not for kids. The the animated show, not for kids. It's not. (laughs) Well, except here's where I have to push back. When did you watch it? I watched it Saturday mornings. When you were a kid, yes. Did you did you like it? I didn't. I I did like it, but some so, of the things. Well, that's a good point because some of the things that I'm alluding to that are not for kids. When I was a kid, I didn't get them at all, yeah. so it didn't matter. I mean, think about like uh, watching Bugs Bunny episodes or Simpsons episodes. There, you know, if you're a kid watching those things, there are a million references that you're not getting. And you're liking what you're liking, you know? I love Looney Tunes cartoons. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't make me laugh. <laughs> They're great. But I didn't know, like, that was Humphrey Bogart or that that was a reference to, you know, something going on in the world. I didn't know about, 
I mean, like, there's the episode with the penguin, which is all Treasures of the Sierra Madre references. Like, I didn't know that watching it. Can you help a guy down on his luck? Yep. <laughs> Hit the um, road. <laughs> And I like, too, that now that the, the we're in the hangover phase of these drugs, Imras and Scotty are no longer into each other. And they do finally hear hear from Kirk. And we realize, but it's, for some reason, it still takes them a long time to beam up. Maybe the transporter room people are still down, dancing. <laughs> um, and they toss the crystals at the creatures and they end up in one of the creatures' mouths. And I just think the whole way that this is handled in terms of an action sequence, doesn't work. Yeah, I don't I understand what it the hell's going on. not well uh, directed, I would say. Well, and I go like, well, did the crystals have an effect on the creature or did it not? I can't tell. Can you? Well, as when, when the, the, the big rock, when Kirk threw the crystals at the big rock creature and it, it went down his throat, the rock creature turned around and went after the other rock creature. So I guess it did work. But did they go to attack each other or were they in love with each? But then there's, I don't know, it's just all. There was only one rock creature that he threw the crystals down, right? Right. So so it didn't matter what the other one was doing because the one that Kirk threw the, the crystals at, the reaction that that one had was to take on the other rock creature. So it was enough of a diversion for them to get off the planet. Sure, but this is a love potion. So did it work as a love potion? I don't know. It just doesn't, it just doesn't I have make no sense. Idea. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And the action sequence, there's like this moment where Kirk is just standing between the two giant rock creatures, not doing anything. And I'm like, go for cover or something. Like it just, it's not a, it's not a well done sequence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But Kirk also does do a roll, which is a classic Kirk move. And we do manage to get away. And then we're back with Spock and Chapel and Spock offers to help her record the confession. And she says, with a lot of asperity in her voice, You! You'd be the last person I'd choose. Because now the love potion has turned to a hatred potion. All right, so so the love potion has worn off. And now they're, they're, it, it has had the opposite effect, where right. a few moments of love are followed by several hours of hatred. Or, as I like to call it, withdrawal. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's how drugs work. <laughs> Think I'll get rehabilitation therapy again? I can guarantee it. Well, that's all right. I just hate to leave you all. All my loved ones. <laughs> and that brings us to the end. I don't podcast. understand his line. Is like is Harry still being affected by the drugs? Uh, I took a question, but did it, was Harry ever affected by the truth? That's why I don't, cause he wasn't on the ship when the gas started flying around. He didn't take the drugs. Like, why is he being so nice? And when he says, I just hate to leave you all, all my loved ones. And then laughs. I don't know. Is he saying loved ones sarcastically and laughing? I don't understand the joke. I don't understand. I, what's thought, I thought that he was dripping with sarcasm. Okay. Yeah. It's very possible. Well, this is the last time that we see Harry Mudd make a canon appearance on Star Trek until the year 2017 on an episode of Star Trek Discovery called Choose Your Pain, where Harry Mudd was played by Rain Wilson. And well, when it comes to Star Trek Discovery, all I'll say is Choose Your Pain was actually a really good episode. Okay, there you go. (laughs) I found this to be a fun episode. I think there's a bunch of stuff in here that doesn't track perfectly in terms of what the love potion is and what does Harry know. And I think there's an absolutely terrible character choice from Nurse Chapel, which if she doesn't make that terrible character choice, we don't have an episode. And it does have some fun, cute stuff. I definitely think this is one that could have been really interesting uh, expanded into an episode. And I'm going to go back to... The combo, I'm going to add to it now, the combo of the Venus drug with this love crystal and the powers from Plato's stepchildren would really make for a good party. That would be an awesome party. I would never leave uh, that planet if I had yeah. that drug. Uh, I, I had a lot of fun with this. I, I think I like this more than Once Upon a Planet because, like I said, I laughed out loud quite a few times. Right. And 
rediscovering these animated episodes, this has been one of the joys of it. You know, I, I never really had uh, a, a desire to go back and rewatch Mud's Passion. And it was not one of the ones I was looking forward to rewatching when I knew that we were going to move forward and cover the animated series. But in watching it, I love that it, it completed a Harry Mudd trilogy for the original series. I love that Roger C. Carmel reprised his voice and his his VO performance was actually quite good and in, in line with the character he played twice in the original series. The the there there is a lot to sort of connect the dots with the relationship between Spock and uh, as Nurse Chapel, and it's almost like a role reversal from what we saw in the Naked Time. Because in the naked time, you know, Chapel falls under the spell and Spock is like, no, I'm sorry, I can't do this. And now this time around, Spock is the one who falls manly in love. And first Chapel's like, hey, I'm down with this. And then she realizes, you know, she's not. But it's it's uh there's a lot to really like about this, you know, despite the shortcomings that we've talked about many times with the animated series. Uh, I feel like this one succeeds more than it doesn't, and it was very entertaining, and uh, and I really enjoyed it. So that's what we think of Mud's Passion. Of course, we'd love to hear your thoughts, maybe on our Facebook page where you can search for Enterprise Incidents. Maybe you like Twitter where it's Enter Incidents, or maybe you like all those pretty pictures on Instagram where it's Enterprise Incidents. Please subscribe to the show if you haven't already. You could do so on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Overcast, on YouTube, on a whole bunch of other places. But if you are on Apple Podcasts, a review makes a huge difference. The reviews, Scott, have, are always excellent, but they kind of slowed down lately. And I think we could probably do something to remedy that situation with you leaving your review. And if you want to support the show right in the show notes, it's now Spotify Podcasts. You can click on the link there. and It'll take you to the Spotify Podcast page where you can support Enterprise Incidents for as little as 99 cents a month. But $9.99 a month is a much, much better amount as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we do work really hard on the show, and we could definitely use your support. And if you want to reach me, it's SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And if you're interested in love potions on the cinephiles, there is the film Excalibur, where Merlin uses his magic to make Egraine fall in love with Arthur's father, Uther Pendragon. Scott, how would people reach you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance. That's nice and easy. And I just want to second what Steve Morris said about leaving a review for us on Apple Podcasts. Those reviews sure do mean a lot to us. We'd love to get your feedback. And if you have been meaning to leave a review for Enterprise Incidents, but just haven't had the time or it's the end of the episode and you kind of click right off and just move on to the next thing, please do take a moment now, head over to Apple Podcasts, Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve and leave us a review. We've been doing this now for more than two years and we are loving every minute of it and we sure do love your support. Please share Enterprise Incidents on your social media pages to help more people find us. And like Steve said, please support us. We appreciate any donations you can be generous enough to give. Meanwhile, next time on Enterprise Incidents, we're going to dive into an animated series episode in where things get bigger or things get smaller. Depends on what your perspective is. But if your perspective is that you're one of the crew members on the Enterprise, everything's getting a lot bigger because you're getting a lot smaller on the Territon Incident. That is next time on Enterprise Incidents. I'm looking forward to this one. I have fond memories of watching that one. That's a very easy one to remember. Can't wait to dive into that with my good pal, Steve Morris. So please join us. And until next time on Enterprise Incidents, please keep going boldly.